Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Take One. Okay, for those of you who don't know, the Vancouver International Film Festival happened here in Vancouver from the 28th of September until the 8th of October. These are the movies that I saw before the festival began via screener link. So the first film that I actually watched was Totem, which Totem, for those of you who don't know, is a small... Mexican film that is actually this film Totem is actually Mexico's submission for best international feature at the 2024 Oscars and I love Totem I thought it was a gorgeous incredibly subtle incredibly understated film that is yet able to pack a very powerful punch and convey a very powerful message uh, this is a movie that is very much told from the perspective of the main character who is a younger child you know a young girl and this film plays beautifully with her perspective, with the fact that the whole story is told from her perspective. So basically, for those of you who don't know, uh, the story of Totem is pretty much, um, there is this young girl, she's dealing with some hard stuff in her life. Mainly, her father is very ill, and you know he won't be living forever. That said, due to the fact that this whole movie is told from the perspective of the girl, we see the illness of the father from a very naive, from a very innocent perspective. You know, from the perspective of a child who doesn't really know death, you know, who hasn't really been touched by some of these, you know, calamities or by some of the biggest tragedies of life. So we see this film from this very naive, innocent perspective, and it is just absolutely heart-wrenching to see this girl just navigating her life being kind of unaware of this horrible, very tragic and sad thing that is happening, you know, right next to her that she doesn't really quite comprehend. This movie is filled with some beautiful, magical moments. Uh, there is a scene where the, the main girl is pretending to sing that it was just absolutely charming, absolutely enchanting. Um, that said, this film might not be for everyone because this is very much a plotless movie. This is very much a slice of life film. Uh, you're following the life of this girl, you know, going through her day to day life, playing, doing chores, doing different things. But there isn't really a story. There isn't really like an antagonist or something that we're building up. Well, there is something that we're building up to that is very sad. Um, but, you know, n not like in a in a in a conventional narrative way I guess so it might not be for everyone but you know if this sounds for you like you know a slice of life kind of slow movie where you're just following this girl as she lives her day-to-day -day life then this might be the movie for you I found it charming I found it heart-wrenching and the ending was so so powerful of course no spoilers but I am just very impressed with just how much the very ending the final shots of the movie were able to convey without any words, without any explanations, without holding your hand or, you know, spoon-feeding you what's actually happening, just by visuals, the last couple of shots of this movie are able to convey so, so much. And it is simultaneously sad, heart-wrenching, but it is also a beautiful, beautiful movie. So I'll definitely be rooting for this one. <laughs> I hope this one gets nominated for Best International Feature. I absolutely love Totem. And if I were to give Totem a score between 1 and 10, I would give it an 8 out of 10, which means I thought this film was great. Now, the next movie I watched before the festival began was another Latin American film. And this one was Chronicles of a Wandering Saint, or Las Cronicas de una Santa Errante. And I also love this movie. I thought this film was incredibly charming and incredibly unique. And that is what I love the most about this film. It's uniqueness. So the main character in this film, Chronicles of a Wandering Saint, is basically this older woman who is faking all of these miracles, who is pretending that she can do all of these miracles just to gain some status, you know, to gain some clout amongst her group of church-going friends. Come on, that in and of it itself is incredibly quirky and incredibly original, but you know, the film doesn't just stop there. That is the setup, that is how the movie begins, but the film completely reinvents itself halfway through. At the halfway point, the movie changes drastically, and honestly, when I was watching this at home in my computer, you know, my jaw was dropped, I had no idea what was going on, and... Part of me wished I would have watched this in theaters because I. part of me was like, oh my god, I w need to know how people, how audience members reacted when, you know, the thing that happens in the middle of this movie actually happens. Of course, no spoilers, but uh, 
Yeah, I, I loved it. I really, the way this film reinvents insel- itself is really charming, really unique, really quirky. Uh, this film is also full of some great comedic moments. It is full of some great conversations and some beautiful, beautiful visuals, particularly in the second half of the film, which I won't, I won't spoil. I won't say anything about the second half of the film, but there are some great visually striking, visually rich moments. I would also give Chronicles of a Wandering Saint an 8 out of 10. It is a great, great film. Um, now, the next movie I saw was a film called Humanist Vampire Seeking Consenting Suicidal Person. And I like this movie. I, I like Humanist Vampire Seeking Consenting Suicidal Person. Uh, I think the title is great. I, I freaking love the title. Uh, that is what drew me the most towards the movie. And I think the film is just as quirky and charming as its title. The protagonist is very quirky and charming. The cinematography is very quirky and charming. And the, the film is full of quirky and charming moments. I think my favorite moment of the film, without giving away any spoilers, is there's a part where two characters are just vibing to music kind of dancing, kind of bobbing, and I, I, thought that, I thought that was, you know, beautifully encapsulated what this movie was. was. That said, I didn't love this movie as much. I, I, I like it, I think it's a good film, but I think the thing that worked the least for me was A, the world building. I thought the world building was kind of weak, especially because, you know, we're dealing with vampires, we're meant to believe that these characters have been doing what they do for hundreds and hundreds of years and yet they were like they, they were so sloppy in like an unrealistic way that it kind of took me out of the movie and I'm like I don't know if this if, if, if this were real vampires which I mean <laughs> there are no real vampires but if they were real vampires I'm sure they will have you know some better rules some better guidelines they would be doing doing things in a less sloppy way than you know this film shows us. Uh, and then something else that didn't I didn't really love that didn't really work for me about humanist vampire seeking consenting suicidal person, long ass title. Uh, something else that didn't work for me was I feel like after after the first third of the movie, uh, there is this male character that gets you know thrust into the story as kind of a co lead and. Uh, Ah, I don't know. I, I I didn't really like the direction in which this male character took the story. I thought it was good. I thought it was fine, but I thought the other story about you know this 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 humanist vampire and her relationship with her family that is what I really really loved. In conclusion, I like humanist vampire seeking consenting suicidal person, and I would give it a six out of ten. A, a very solid six out of ten, almost a seven, I guess I should say. Um. Then the next movie I watched before the festival actually began was called Red Rooms. And this is one of the most disturbing and effed up movies I've ever seen. Red Rooms are places where, you know, women, particularly younger women, get kidnapped and get tortured. And usually the stuff that happens in these Red Rooms gets live streamed in the deep web for you know depraved people who are willing to pay a lot a lot of money to get access to these videos um and this you know this movie this movie focuses very much on on red rooms and it is kind of a courtroom drama where two women who are obsessed with this guy uh, with this horrible human being who is accused of doing all of that, of, of, you know, of torturing younger women, of kidnapping younger women and torturing them in red rooms. And the movie follows these two characters who are just obsessed with this guy for different reasons, which I won't delve into because I don't want to spoil anything. But yeah, uh, even though it is an incredibly disturbing movie and even though it is incredibly hard to watch at times, I thought this movie was amazing, exceptionally well made. The movie does an incredible job of putting you in the shoes of a character you don't want to be in the shoes of. You don't want to be in the shoes of the protagonist. The protagonist is not a nice person. She is not a good person, but she's a fascinating person and that makes it worth it, in my opinion. There are some haunting scenes, some moments that, you know, just gave me shivers. Um... Yeah, extremely well-made movie with some incredibly poignant moments. This is a movie that perfectly understands that sometimes what is not shown to the viewers could be even more scary than what is. You know, usually when you watch a movie and there's like a gory scene, it's, it's just that, you know, it's gore. You can see the gore. But sometimes when you watch a movie and there's a gory scene happening or there's a violent scene happening, but they don't show you the violence. You know, you, you, you hear the screams and you hear what's going on, but you don't really see what's taking place. Sometimes that can be even more effective. 
this film just uses that cinematic technique perfectly. You know, the idea that what is not shown is even more scary than what is. Uh, so I, I have to give extra points for that. This film is, is just expertly made, expertly crafted. The, the last thing I'll say, this is just a little anecdote, this is not really about the movie, is once again, I watched this movie via screener link. And for those of you who don't know, usually when they send you a link to be able to watch a movie from your computer, some movies, some some of them come with like, with with watermarks, you know, with like a little sign that says Juan Pablo Sai, you know, that says my name on the screen so that the studio can make sure that I'm not screenshotting the film and that I'm not screen recording the film. And I'll just say that it was a wild experience to see this very disturbing dark movie and then see my name on screen, you know, some very disturbing things were happening in the film. And then I just look to the right and I just see Juan Pablo Sai and I was like, oh boy, this is this is weird. But uh. Yeah, you know, first time for everything, I guess. But, I, you know, overall, great experience. Thank you for sending me a screener link. If I were to give it a score in between 1 and 10, I would give it a 9 out of 10. I think this film is amazing. It is hard to watch. It is not for everyone. It is very, very disturbing. But it is an amazing piece of cinema that uses cinematic language in a perfect, perfect way. Um... Now, another film that I saw before the festival actually began is one called I Used to Be Funny, and it stars Rachel Sennett, and I was really excited for this movie because I, I love Rachel Sennett. I love what I've seen of her. I absolutely adore Shiva Baby, and I thought her performance in Shiva Baby was absolutely incredible. Uh, I also really love Bottoms, which recently ca came out, and you know her performance in Bottoms was also hysterical, and I love Bodies, 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 which, by the way, I reviewed in this channel, like, you know, around a year ago and her performance in bodies 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 i also thought was pretty pretty exceptional so i was very excited for this one i was very excited for it used to be funny but i'm sad to say that i didn't like this one i it, it, it wasn't for me and i guess the best way i could put it is i found this film incredibly cringy incredibly cheesy in a very very cringy way and um i'll just give you an example i'll give you an example of what i mean this film is full of scenes where Rachel Sennett is just sighing, thinking about the past, and then she finds a Polaroid picture, and she looks at the Polaroid, and she is reminded of the perfect life that she used to have, and then she sighs, and then like a little string guitar in the background starts playing, and then it fades to a flashback where we see the happy moment that Rachel Sennett is remembering. So... You see what I mean? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the level of cringe and cheesiness that I'm talking about. And, you know, it might just be me. It might just be me because I have friends who have watched I Used To Be Funny and they really loved it. They thought it was great. So it might just be me, but I, 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 could, I just could never get into this film. I found it very cringy, very cheesy. There are some effective moments. There are some good moments. And, and Rachel Sennett's performance is once again incredible. She is doing... She's doing her best. She's doing her best with what she's given. If I were to give I Used To Be Funny a score in between 1 to 10, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sad to say this, but I, I would give it a 5 out of 10. I thought it was pretty meh. There's some good stuff, but it's just pretty mediocre in my opinion. Now, the last, th the last film that I saw before the festival actually began was absolutely amazing. Uh, it, it was a documentary called 32 Sounds, which for those of you who are you know, who, who've watched all of Take One videos, you know that I, you know, I, I, a couple of days ago, I released an interview with Sam Green, the director of 32 Sounds. Uh, and in order to prep for that interview, they sent me a screener link for this documentary for 32 Sounds. I absolutely loved it. I, I thought this documentary was just mind-blowingly good. I, I, I thought it was incredible. I thought it was unlike anything I've ever seen before. Uh, I think on my letterbox review, when I reviewed 32 Sounds, I think I wrote something along the lines of like, you know, it feels like a disservice to call 32 Sounds a documentary uh, because, you know, more than that, it is just this incredible sensory experience that engages with your sense of hearing like nothing I've ever seen before. And once again, I, I loved it. it. It's a fascinating documentary. It is a documentary that is all about the relationship between humans and sounds, you know, the relationship between humans and our sense of hearing. And as the title implies, it takes us in this beautiful sonic journey through 32 different sounds that, in, in my opinion, beautifully encompass what it means to be a human and what it means to hear. 
uh, the different applications, the different ways sound surrounds us. And I generally believe if you watch 32 Sounds, you'll never listen to the world in the same way. I won't delve deep into this one because, once again, there is already an interview in my channel. But what I'll say is what fascinated me about this documentary is, for those of you who don't know, Sam Green makes live documentaries. And basically what that is, is he turns documentaries into this live in-person theatrical events. He turns documentaries into theatrical experiences. Even though 32 Sounds is one of Sam Green's live documentary and he did perform it live here at the Vancouver International Film Festival, he did mention in the interview that it will eventually come out as a conventional documentary on iTunes. So if you stumble onto... Uh, 32 sounds at one point, definitely check it out. It is an amazing experience. It is a documentary unlike any I've ever seen before. And Sam Green was just, you know, an, an absolute delight. I, I loved interviewing him. I'm very proud of that interview. So if this piques your interest, definitely check that out. But yeah, that is everything I watched before the festival actually began. Then on the 28th of September, the festival began, but we're going to talk about that on the next part of this series. But that is it for part one. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. Ooh.